Lego me. Dear Mom, I like to play for you. I love you with my whole heart. You, I love how you make my uh, lunch, my dinner, and I love you. chicken tacos because they're the best and her hugs. I love you mama. The things I love about my mama is that she snuggles me every morning and every night time she kisses me. I love you mama. Happy Mother's Day. Um, I like that we play games together. I love you, Mama, very much. I like that we spend time together, go eat together. Love you, Mama. Happy Mother's Day. I love that we um, play Legos together. personality and her ridiculous jokes. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. I love when Mom helps us make desserts and learn new recipes to cook together. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. The thing I like the most about my mommy is that she cuddles with me a lot. My favorite thing to do with my mom is to play games and ride bikes with each other. The favorite thing that I like to do with my mom is to go on trips with her and like that time we went over, we went to Yellowstone last year and she makes the best pizzas in the world. I love you, mom. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. She's nice and she doesn't get mad that often and she misses me all the time when I'm leaving. And that makes me feel happy because she misses me. You are a best. I love you, Mama. I love you, Mama. Boys, what's your favorite thing about your mommy? Um, her kisses. What yeah. about you? <laughs> we love you, Mommy. We Say, love you, Mommy. That's right. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning, church. Welcome, welcome. Uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, we just want to say we're so thankful to have you all tuning in today, and we're so thankful for all of our mothers that are represented here today, and we just hope that you all enjoy this time of fellowship and worship together as we worship the King. Worship. 
ship our king Come let us bow at his feet He has done great things See what our Savior has done Let's See how his love overcomes He has done great things He has done great
strength No word he spoke His love was shown For all to see All the cross of Jesus Christ Floods the night as hope prevails to shine. Salvation waves our chains to break, and we rise. Oh, the cross of Jesus Christ. pray. Father God, we just thank you for the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for our salvation. May it never grow old. Every day, God, may we just have joy as we remember what you've done, the sacrifice that you've made, the mercy that you've shown, your patience with your children, God. God, you, you delight in us, and we, we just thank you, Father God, for, for loving us, for meeting us where we are, but not leaving us unchanged, Lord. God, I lift up our church during this time. I pray for all of our members, God. I pray over their health, their safety. 
God, I pray for financial, for mental, for spiritual health, God. And I lift up our community, our country, and our nation, God. May your great name be known today and in the days ahead, God. We thank you for this time of worship. And we lift up the message and all of these songs in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's go. 
Hi, I'm Katie Sally, the children's pastor here at Fellowship. Thanks for joining us. While we are unable to join together in the physical church building, we will continue to provide new sermons weekly in digital format. We pray that your family will use this time to worship together, and we hope that you will share the sermons on social media with your friends and loved ones so that they can do the same. Let's be intentional about connecting with those around us when we are unable to be together physically. For those who are wondering how they will continue tithing, you can go to the Fellowship app or website to do so. And now, here's this week's message. Hey, church family, it's Pastor Derek. I just want to wish you a very warm and exciting Mother's Day. Um, Happy Mother's Day to all of you that have impacted our lives in more ways than we spend enough time accounting for. Uh, Without you, we wouldn't be here. And we're grateful that uh, God appointed you to be stewards of our lives. And I want to encourage you to understand as well that motherhood is more than biology. It transcends biology. It's, it, it knows no bound, no color, no creed, no race. There are spiritual mothers that are, are full in the church. There are so many spiritual mothers. There are mothers that perhaps have adopted or taken people under their roofs and homes. And we're so grateful because motherhood is a high calling. And it is a calling of God and the purposes of God to invest and sow seeds of grace into those to whom they are given. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, Pray that your day is blessed and that it's full of time of reflection and that your families, both physical, biological, and spiritual, are encouraging you and loving on you and demonstrating how they feel about you for your tremendous sacrifice and your gift for being a mother to us. So thank you so much for that. That being said, the title of my message this morning is Glimpses of Grace. As I was preparing for this message, I did it a little differently than what I typically do. I like to sit down and find a singular text primarily and work through the deriving points. Um, It's a certain style of of sermon building and preaching that uh, I'm very comfortable with and I enjoy. And uh, I find that it bears out a lot of fruit for me personally. But I wanted to take a different angle for Mother's Day. And I wanted to try to see life through the viewfinder of what a mother is. Now, I can't do that. Obviously, I'm a father and I'm a son. But I picked up um, some works by some, some godly women and began flipping through some pages and reading some of the material. And so the sermon title, Glimpses of Grace, was born out of that. And uh, I think that the title is telling, and I hope that by the end of this message, that you too find yourself appreciating glimpses of grace in your families and in your lives. Psalm 118 is where I want us to start. Verses 24, 28 through 29. And it says this, and we're all very familiar, I'm sure. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Man, I find that encouraging, and I hope that you do on Mother's Day as you, as you think about how faithful God is and how good God is and how good God is to us, those of us that are recipients of your love as mothers. But this is much broader than that. I don't want to find that we're, we're pinpointing this too much as the gospel applies to all of us in all walks in life. Mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, grandchildren, co-workers. It's, it, it's so big that it can catch all of us and embrace us in its truth. You know, I have had the, the privilege, obviously, like all of us, of, uh, I, have, I do have a wonderful mother. Uh, she loved me. She always provided for me. And uh, she was gracious. And while... I think that any mother that's honest says that they don't do things perfectly. But whatever effort she had, God used to move in her life in a way that at some point, when I was 21 years old as a young man, the Lord got a hold of my heart. And it was through various experiences and seeds of grace sown in my life along the way that uh, brought my heart to the Lord. And I'm forever grateful for that. I find that I have a fondness and appreciation for my wife, Lachelle. Uh, you know, we've had many conversations and I think that sometimes she believes that I'm, I'm being a bit of a prankster because I like to joke. Um, I love humor and I'll tell her things like, you know, she'll say, hey, you know, you have a lot going on with, you know, pastorate and the chaplaincy and all, whatnot. And I always remind her, I say, your job is the hardest job. My job is easy. 
It's, it's, it's singular, it's one lane, it's focused, but her job and the job of all moms is balancing life with little image bearers. And that's not an easy task. Um, and one of the things, you know, from mount laundry to full diapers, schoolwork, some of you are enduring the challenges right now during coronavirus of what homeschool looks like. And uh, while I admit I do find a little bit of amusement in it, as we started off before coronavirus saying, man, you know, I'm thinking about homeschooling. I think that that would be a good idea. And uh, now you're just hoping that you don't murder your children. And uh, we, I, can, I can appreciate that. My wife, uh, she does homeschool our kids. And I see the, the amount of effort and work and diligence that goes into that to make sure that it's done to the glory of God. But for those of you that have late nights and early mornings, for those of you that will take a phone call in the middle of the night from somebody that perhaps is not your biological child, but your spiritual child, thank you for that. Really, with all our heart, thank you so much for doing what you do. The Westminster Catechism, the very first question in it, is something that I try to instill in our children. And it says, what is the chief end of man? Uh, man not being biological men, but all people. And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I think that we have, we're inclined sometimes to the glorify God part. I think we can get that down somewhat, um, although imperfectly. But enjoying God is something I think we miss. We miss so much in how we do life. And um, I think that the burdens of, of, of motherhood sometimes and, and other challenges in life can rob us of enjoying who God is. And my hope for you today and my prayer for you today is that when you leave here, that the gospel would so profoundly impact your life and your hearts that you would see the glimpses of grace, the goodness of God, that you would enjoy His presence in your life. You know, we, we find that in enjoying God sometimes, we have to ask this question, is how do we enjoy Him? And sometimes we'll make this leap in association with God and we'll say, well, God is most evident in miracles. Now, there are two definitions that show up in miracles. One is this, an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. And then the other one is an extremely outstanding or unusual event, thing, or accomplishment. Now, you would not be wrong if you recognize that a miracle is something a supernatural act of God. And he can fault you for that. <clears throat> but I think that in our culture, we pursue that so ruthlessly that we miss the tiny glimpses of grace, the small miracles from the day-to-day -day mundane. And that will bring us into my first point. Don't miss the miraculous in the mundane. You know, we spend most of our time in the mundane. The day-to-day -day monotony, tedious task. We get up in the morning, you do breakfast. If you're a mom, you know, you're, you're likely doing a mountain of laundry. Laundry never ends, right? I mean, I've had that conversation with my wife. Uh, the laundry is endless. It's like a black hole. You just keep throwing stuff in there and throwing stuff in there. And uh, it keeps you very busy. And then you have kids and kids have to do certain things and they have to be guided along the way. They're not autonomous. They're small image bearers and gifts from God that require a great deal of attention and effort. And you know, when we think of the miraculous and the extraordinary in contrasting to the mundane, it's kind of like when you first enter into a marriage. You know, it begins and everybody, you know, the, the, hopefully she said yes when you asked, uh, for those of you that that's not true, I'm sorry, my heart hurts with you, I bear that burden with you, but let's just assume that you pop the question, she says yes, and you're on that high, and you're like, man, this is wonderful, God is good, I have this wonderful, godly woman, uh, the wedding is coming, it's so exciting, and then what happens? What happens after the honeymoon? You feel like you lose the extraordinary and exchange it with mundane, right? If you're like my wife and I, you know, we find out after 10 years of marriage, well, I have a bad habit of leaving socks on the side of the bed, and uh, that's challenging. Or, you know, we do little quirky things as we learn to do life together. And because we're in there so often, we're in this mundane, we're in this routine, this nine to five, or whatever your hours are, whatever you do on a regular basis, I think we lose perspective sometimes. And we become so obsessed with the fact that this is the same all, same all every day, that we miss the miracle in moments to moments. 
You know, my wife and I have had the uh, I've had the, the privilege of seeing some of the fruit of what she does in their lives, bearing out in her own children as a personal example. Um, my kids, if they ever stay at your house, full disclosure, warning, they're not super Christians or anything like that. They're still kids. Uh, they are uh, wicked little sinners, um, as are all children. Amen. But uh, I love them dearly and they will show us glimpses of the moments of what their mother and I have sown into their lives. When they go and stay over at your house, right? They'll say, well, we can't go to bed. We've got to pray. That has happened on more than one occasion. And that does something to my heart and says, you know, I may not always recognize it in the mundane experiences of life, but God is working. And I'm seeing the fruits of that tilling in their hearts of the grace that we sow into them when they say, hey, we can't do this without praying. You know, I'm not much of an emotional man. I try not to be. Um, my, uh, I don't know why that is. I think maybe just the way that I grew up. But my daughter will, uh, will break my heart when she does this sometimes, and, and in a good way, not, you know, I'm, I'm in despair or anything. She's begun this thing as a result of being here and listening to the wonderful worship experience at FCC. She will sing Waymaker, and that's a beautiful song. But when you listen to your three-year-old daughter singing unto the Lord God, man, that is precious. And those are moments in the mundane. They're miracles in the mundane because what's happening is God is taking a heart that is, that is wicked above all else and beginning to reshape who she is, beginning to reshape who he is. It reshapes us. It changes everything about our lives. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whatever you eat or drink and whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You ever thought about that? It seems radically impractical. And yet we're here we are, we're commanded to do it. This is not a suggestion. It is in fact a commandment. It is an imperative. Do laundry to the glory of God. Mow the lawn to the glory of God. You know, I've enjoyed the last uh, couple of weeks we've been helping out uh, my wife's grandfather in his garden and uh, farming for most of you that are true farmers they were just getting into this thing it's hard work it, it's a it's a laborious task it's very very challenging um, and in the heat of louisiana sun if you don't get out early enough you will get scorched and uh, but what i've learned to appreciate in that moment is that you do that you labor to that to the glory of god and you watch God in those moments begin to work and grow something and bear something out of consistent and persistent work. You know, we find in uh, Hosea, he says, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. I love that so much. Sow for yourself righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Steadfast love, meaning it, it continues, it, it, it endures to the end, just like the love of God for us. What does that mean? It's not a single solitary moment. And that it carries on with us in the mundane, in the monotonous, in the day-to-day -day routines. You know, Paul Tripp says it this way. He says, if God doesn't rule your mundane, he doesn't rule over you because that is where you live. And that is where I live. If God is not the God of the mundane, and only in the high points of my life, in the extraordinary circumstances of my life, I'm missing the gospel at work. Gloria Furman, the, uh, the author of the book of Glimpses of Grace, in which this title comes from, says, The Word of God is for everyday people who do everyday things. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that special that the Word of God is powerful and profound that it is and the truth found in it is that you and I can walk in such a way daily with the Lord that we can witness glimpses of grace, small miracles in the mundane of our lives. You know, we will pursue, in some groups of Christianity, they will pursue events, signs and wonders, come and see, watch me stretch a leg, all kinds of wild stuff like that, right? Let's handle some snakes, just wild bonkers stuff. And we will run, some groups, not me, I'm not much of a fan of those things, but we'll run to see those things. And man, I want to see a mighty move of God. And yet, perhaps somebody that you're dear to or near to or your own children, do something subtle. Help the other one up. 
perhaps help clean, maybe just bring you something as a gesture of kindness. Those are always present in our lives, and yet we're so preoccupied with the bombastic, miraculous things that only happens in the smallest percentage, if at all, in so many people's lives. We miss the miracles that are right in front of us in our experiences into the day-to-day things. And those lessons, how we respond to that truth before people that we care dearly about are lessons that will last a lifetime because they will see this radical change in experience with relationship with who God is and how we live in the routine and the monotony. And they will never forget that because that is where you and I live. And that's okay. It really is. My second point. The gospel permeates every arena of our lives, not just a singular moment. If you grew up in the church like I did, you often would probably hear, you know, you'd be given gospel tracts or whatnot, or you'd have the Romans road to read. And the idea behind it was this massive uh, evangelistic effort by the church to go and bring the good news to the ends of the earth. Now, I want to preface and say that I'm not saying that that's a bad thing whatsoever. I think it's wonderful. We should be living and breathing the gospel to those around us. It is the only hope. It is the good news, not one good news of many, but the good news. The only way to reconcile things between us and the Father is through Jesus Christ. There's no other means of doing that. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And yet, when we communicate that, we inadvertently sometimes isolate the gospel impact to one singular moment, namely our salvation. And while those are wonderful, what we fail to see sometimes is the lifelong impact of gospel change. We'll recognize and point to a story. And I, I've even heard this said sometimes. Well, you know, my testimony is not that good. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the church and didn't do a whole lot of horrible things. I don't have a dark, broken moment. And I said, wait a minute. No. It's radical change. You went from an enemy of God to being a child of God because of what he has done for you in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter about the previous story. You may have some points there to share. Maybe you did live live like me. You lived a a radically opposed to the gospel kind of life, opposed to God, and God changed you. But see, those are wonderful things to share, but we can't stop there. We cannot stop in that moment. You see, because the love of God in us goes on. It continues. The gospel continues to empower us for day-to-day living. You know, we, and when people see that, They think that, okay, single solitary moment, and then I'm just going it alone the rest of the time. And that's not true at all. God is not far from any one of us. The Holy Spirit of God resides in us if you are a believer. You know, the Apostle Paul says in Acts 17, 28, he says, In Him we live and move and have our being. Not that He just shows up once, one and done, but that we in Him we live and move and have our being. So the next time you go in and the sink is full of filthy dishes, or you got to take the trash out again, and maybe the bag busted and there's stuff everywhere, understand that in Jesus we live and move and have our being. That God is always working in those circumstances and in those challenges. He's not just isolated to one singular event in our lives. He's always with us. He's always working. Even when we don't see it, God is working. He is faithful. You know, Hebrews 12, one through two says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. But for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Christian life is one of continual running, continually working. And we have to be careful, and we'll get to that on the third point, to not look at that and say, man, I have to work really hard to get this right. Because I hope that you can be set free today. I want to lift that burden from you. But it's not a single moment, and instead, it is a lifetime of faithful perseverance and fruit bearing. One of the quotes, and it is a little lengthy, but I think that it's worthwhile reading because it makes the point from a Milton Vincent. It says this, The gospel is the one great permanent circumstance in which I live and move. 
And every hardship in my life is allowed by God only because it serves His gospel purposes in me. Isn't that good? When I view my circumstances in this light, I realize the gospel is not just one piece of good news that fits into my life somewhere among the bad. I realize instead that the gospel makes genuinely good news out of every other aspect of my life, including the severest trials. The good news about my trials is that God is forcing them, and get this, to bow to His gospel purposes and do good unto me by improving my character and making me more conformed to the image of Christ. Isn't that just radical? It's so radical that even when things are difficult and you want to maybe lock those little image bearers in the closet because you're driving you just absolutely bananas, that God is using those moments by the power of His gospel and His truth living in you through the Holy Spirit to begin to conform you and make you more like His Son, Jesus Christ. God is so very, very good. You won't do it perfectly. Let's just be real. And I think that we are inclined to pretend that we do it perfectly in a church, right? We're supposed to have it all together all the time is what people think. Um, but that's, a, that's simply not true. That's not true. Because when we realize that we're not going to do it perfectly, we, we begin to create margin and space in our hearts to understand that God is the one that does it perfectly. God is the good and faithful one. God is the lover of our souls. It is His power, His gospel, His spirit that walks with us on this journey that will take us a lifetime to grow and become more and more like His Son. So when again the dishes pile up in the laundry's mountain, don't throw it at somebody. Pause, enter into that space and say, God, what are we teaching? What are you teaching me here? The next time, you know, if you let your kids go outside to mow or something like that, and they miss a spot or maybe they run over the flower bed or something, which, you know, me as a dad, I would be furious about it because we put a lot of work into it, right? But um, maybe they do that and they enter in that space and say, you know what? God is still good. God is gracious. Here's, a, here's an opportunity for me to sow seeds of grace into my children's lives, understanding that this is but a glimpse. And on the other side of this thing, we spend eternity with a good God that wants to journey with us for the time that we have just a little while. Because it's like a vapor, right? So enjoy the experiences and the mundane. And my third point is this. The gospel frees me to live to the glory of God. What good is it to point out that we need to, that, to glorify God and adore, endure Him forever if we don't in fact know how? You know, we live in two very different extremes when we approach how we do gospel living and how we sow glimpses or see glimpses of grace in our lives in the mundane. On one hand, we have this radical, oh my gosh, this is insane. I might need to see a therapist. Um, I've thought about tying my kids to a tree outside or this person that calls me every five minutes or calls me every night. Anytime they call, they're, they're complaining, they're pouring their heart out, but they're never taking good advice to try to make that correction. I know that older parents deal with that. I know that spiritual parents deal with that and say, hey, I'm trying to give you good godly advice and you refuse to take it. And it can be the great consternation and frustration on your behalf. And you go, man, I just wish you would listen to me because I've been there and yet, we can become overcome with despair, with challenges, with stress in those moments. And is stress natural? Sure. Despair? No. Not so much. And yet on the other thing, here's what we'll do, is we'll say, okay, I really messed up yesterday. I said some things I shouldn't have said. I yelled at the kids. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to study my Bible every day at this time in this way. Um, and that's going to get it right. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to pray this time, this way, every day. Here's the thing. Let me tell you a really harsh truth. God does not care about your plans. And your plans will often, more than not, blow up in your face because you're putting too much trust into the plan and not the creator. What do I mean? Let's say you're sitting there and you go, okay, I'm going to read my Bible every time of this morning. How many people... If we're honest, can say, anytime I try to do something like that, what happens? Mom, Dad, somebody's coming to get my attention. Can't have five minutes to even sit down and do that. And that's life, right? That's life. Or somebody calls you. Ah, that's life. 
You can't plan for those things. What you can do is understand how to see them through a different lens. We have in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3, he says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We need to get to a place to where in the mundane, our reflex, our response is to go, Lord, you have loved me despite my shortcomings, despite my wickedness. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we can get to a place where we are leaning in on the Lord, and even the most silliest things, maybe we're frustrated because somebody talked to us the wrong way, and you go, you know what? The Lord loves me, and He will not abandon me in this circumstance. And though I didn't get to follow my plan perfectly, or though I may have said some things that I wish that I could take back with all my might, that God is still there in that moment. God is teaching us. He is molding us. He is shaping us. He's not looking at you and saying, hey, I need you to do all these religious things. Because then what happens to us? We become like the Pharisees. We become legalistic in our thinking. And we say, well... You know, I read my Bible every day for, you know, and pray for three hours. Uh, my knees are bruised and bloodied, um, and I'm doing great. And you go, wow. No, no, you're absolutely missing the point. You should read your Bible. You should pray. We're commanded to in Scripture. That's how we develop and cultivate a deeper relationship with our Heavenly Father. You see, like a good dad or a good mom, it's in moments where we are struggling that we should press in. We should press in. Not to impress. Not to lash out at anybody else. But go, God, I need you in this moment. My kids just knocked over the china cabinet. My kids threw a ball at my very, very large 4K Ultra HD TV. And I might have a mini stroke. But God, you're still good. Be gracious to me. Let me handle things with grace. Let me handle things with a type of compassion that you have given to me. You see, because one of the things that I think we mistake sometimes is we forget how deep our sin goes. And therefore, we think we're owed something. And yet this life is a constant and daily lesson in the mundane to recognize the miracle, to recognize glimpses of grace. One of the greatest things about seeing people, if you spend a long time with them or you do life with them for any extended period of time, is that you will have moments, if you notice them, where you will see who that person is becoming in Christ. You'll see glimpses of who they are, and you'll see it in its fullness and eternity together. And God is so good for doing that for us. You know, Isaiah 61.10 says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. God is so good. Garments of salvation. Robe of righteousness. Let's start today seeking glimpses, moments, of gospel influence and grace in our lives and those around us because we live in that mundane we do we really do you know people will read the book of acts and be like man i want to see tongues of fire come down understand this one of the greatest things in the world that maybe you get to see is somebody the miracle of salvation when they finally come to you after all those long night phone calls where you thought they were never going to take your advice and they come back and say you know what god is good i have given myself unto him because he is a good god and he has loved me despite my shortcomings and i want you to know that i am so blessed that you have faithfully taken my calls that you have faithfully prayed for me because god has done a mighty work in my life or when your kids, when they get older and they go off to college and maybe, you know, as, as, as typical, statistically, you find that they, they end up straying from the path. And you go, man, where did I fail to meet the mark as a parent? 
You didn't. Just understand that you didn't. That God is moving and working. And that if you were even faithful momentarily to say things sometimes like, Hey, my kids watched me pray. My kids saw me carry the Bible. My kids saw that it was important that we gather on Sundays to worship our King Jesus. The power for the rest of that is God's. We just need to be faithful. We need to understand that He loves us, that He loves our children, that He loves our neighbor and our co-worker. And then perhaps you maybe never see the fruit bear out. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Because sometimes, or you say, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like. Leave the rest up to God. God is the one that changes hearts, not us. All we can do is be faithful in momentary moments of, of mundane. Wow, I said that twice. It's awful. But uh, don't do that. Sorry, I'm a word guy. Uh, <laughs> but all we can do is be faithful in those moments. We really can. And, and maybe you're not the one that's going to see the fruit. Maybe somebody else will come along and spark that and God will work in that moment. Understand this, that even when you feel like you've missed the mark, in many days that is true for all of us, if we're honest, that the Apostle Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, he said, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God works through us jars of clay who are, 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 are these weak creatures. And he put that very same flesh on for you and I. And for all those who will come to know him, this side of eternity, this side of glory. And when we sow seeds of grace into people, into each other, God is the one that brings the growth and the yield because God is good and he loves you and he loves me. I pray that as you celebrate Mother's Day, perhaps your story is that your biological mother is not around this Mother's Day. Maybe it's the first Mother's Day. Maybe you are estranged from your mother. Maybe your mom, you just don't think they were that great. Understand this, that God can even take moments like that and bring comfort to your hurting heart today. God is not limited by those circumstances. God can bring healing to that estranged mother or father or a sibling or family member. But ultimately, God can bring healing if you don't know who He is and His, per and His Son, Jesus Christ, between you and Him through the blood of Jesus on the cross. I pray that you celebrate and you are blessed and that you see the goodness of God in your day today and the days to come, and that the monotony would not just be mundane and boring, that you would see God working and see those little glimpses of grace. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for moms, uh, biological moms, spiritual moms, people that have come into our lives to speak wisdom and love us right where we're at. I am so grateful, and we are so grateful that you work through the ministry of motherhood. Thank you so much for them. God, I pray that you would help us see your working in our lives in the mundane. And that it's not just a singular moment when we come to know you, but that it is a lifelong journey that you're constantly with us, always by our side, working in us and through us. I pray that we bless, we bless every mother here this morning. I pray that you would give them strength and a renewed sense of vigor for who you are and that you would empower them by your Holy Spirit to live in such a way that their children and their neighbors and their co-workers and their spouses see your power, your gospel on glorious display through our mothers. Thank you so much for them. Thank you for families. Thank you that you work your ministry through families and through your creation. God, I pray that we find a deeper kind of appreciation and love for who you are and what you have done. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.